сан байцгаан нөө хүн төлөвчтэй. Өнөөдөр манай де факто нэвтрүүлгийн зочноор Америкийн нэгдсэн улсын Cato Institute-ийн төлөөлөн үйлдэлтэй зөвлөлийн гишүүн ноён Карл Барни оролцож байна. Карл Барни Cato Institute-ийн төлөөлөн үйлдэлтэй зөвлөлийн гишүүн Тэрээр хандвын хөрөнгөөр үйл ажиллагаагаа явуулдаг Ayn Rand Institute-ийн төлөөлөн өдөрдөх зөвлөлийн гишүүн бөгөөд 1985 оноос эхлэн тус институтуудад өөрөө ханди үргэлж эхэлжээ. 2016 он гэхэд тэрээр тус институтуудад 20 сая ам долларыг хийдийнэ хандуулсан байна. Карл Ангел хүн бөгөөд залуудаа Европ, Энэтхэг, Австралиар олон жил аялж явсаар хэрхэн амьдрахдлаар олон асуудалтай нутаг утсан ба Ayn Rand-ийн философик сонирхон судалж эхэлжээ. Good evening. Good evening. You are with Cato. You are also with Ayn Rand Institute, right? Yeah, I am. Why, what have brought you all this to this sphere of personal liberty and why? Well, um, I began by reading Ayn Rand's books, uh, Atlas Shrugged, which has been translated into Mongolian. Yes. And I found this book very inspiring and it answered a lot of questions for me about life and, and being an entrepreneur, being a successful businessman, and how one should live one's life ethically and decently. It also raised a lot of questions, so I read more of Ayn Rand's books, such as The Fountainhead, which is also uh, translated into Mongolian. In fact, also two other books, uh, We the Living and Anthem, and, and one nonfiction book, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. But as I read uh, these ideas and put them into practice, I found them very beneficial for me and enabled me to be successful in business. So I thought if this is good for me, it could be good for others. And I wanted to spread the ideas that were so good for me. When was that happened? Well. Um, I came to Ayn Rand when I was uh, about 39 years old, mm -hmm. so not young, mm -hmm. and I already had some experience, and mm -hmm. um, I, uh, the book was recommended to me um, in, in, a, in a sort of an unfriendly way. Uh, somebody <laughs> was talking about ideas, and they said, you know, I don't want to have anything that is not earned and deserved by me. And I said, that's a new idea. She said, you need to read a book by Ayn Rand. And she said, that was Atlas Shrugged. And so that's what I started. And um, that was when I was uh, uh, 39. Not earned, not deserved things should not come to you. That's exactly. This was a principle of justice. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you produce something, and because you trade, mm -hmm you earn and deserve a reciprocal trade. You provide your best efforts, your best services or best products for other people and they respond to you. And in a just way, each person gets what they earn and deserve, but not more, but not less. And this is a principle for, for personal individuals, but it's also a principle for a society. And it's almost an anti-corruption principle. Correct. Because when people get what they did not earn, that is wrong. Because then that's, in a sense, that's theft. And if they didn't deserve it, and that's also wrong. That's corrupt. So in a way, in the sum, total sum, if they the final balance sheet, at the balance you see really plus and minus, but at the end you get what you deserve. Exactly. You trade your work for the work and effort of others, uh -huh. and that translates into money frequently. In my, my, I, I manage some private colleges in America and also some private schools. Uh -huh. And my uh, view is that I provide the very best education I possibly can, uh -huh. and I treat my students as customers uh -huh. and provide good service to them. I answer their questions, I help them, I provide a good education for them, which then I deserve the tuition I earn the tuition that they pay for their schooling. Now let's talk about, uh, since you are in this um, education, college, and uh, in schools and colleges, uh, there are public systems in the U.S. also, the public pays, and there are also systems that public don't pay. So how, how do you in general find the system of 
public paying for schools. And so, so the taxpayer education um, in America, there are some really fine colleges and universities, and some are really excellent. But many public colleges and universities in the United States, um, they do not provide good service. Um, they do not respect the students. And it's more they are thinking about themselves and how they can get more tax money and how they can grow from taxpayers, which is corrupt in a way. The private educator has to earn and deserve the tuition. They have to recharge a lot of money for our, our uh, tuition, lots of money. And so for people to come to us, they must believe that they're getting something superior, and they do. Um, we provide a better education within our sphere of education, our sector of education, than government schools. I call them government schools because they are. They're, they're, they're supported by state and federal governments. Mm -hmm. In the States, uh, there are public schools and private schools. What is the ratio? How do they coexist? Do they receive both from any money from uh, the government or only public schools have? Um, there, it, it, for in higher education, in colleges and universities, the private education is in two, two realms. The major nonprofit but private colleges, such as Stanford University and Harvard University and Yale University, these are not go owned by the government. They are private but nonprofit. And mm -hmm. then there are universities which are private for profit. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that, their part of the economy is, is really quite minor, 10, 15 percent. Uh -huh. So most of the, the colleges and universities uh, the, is public education paid for by the taxpayers. And a smaller percentage is paid by private individuals who pay a high tuition because they believe that they can get better education. And they receive. There. What kind of, for example, uh, there are schools, if you can name, private for also profit universities? Yes. The private for profit would be such things as the University of uh, Phoenix, okay. which was a very large um, uh, school group. They had hundreds uh -huh. of thousands of students, hundreds of thousands, both online uh -huh. and on their campuses on uh -huh. ground. Uh -huh. And the University of Phoenix was uh -huh. an innovator, an entrepreneurial company mm -hmm. that put, uh, put emphasis on online education uh -huh. and built it up, which then uh, brought along other colleges and universities to do the same thing. Uh -huh. And then now the, the public, the, the government schools are also going to online. So they created this innovation. And that's the big thing about private education. They are innovators. In, in innovation, okay. They, you have to innovate, you have to be better. And they were very much innovative. And the private schools, that's where the innovation is happening So you today. said 85, 15% private part. yeah. And they, uh, how many of this 15% of private one is about the for-profit? Um, <clears throat> oh, no, I, I, it's actually more than that. I think the for-profit is about 15%. Okay, ah, And I private see. would be perhaps another 15%. So maybe about 30% uh -huh. is private. I don't know the exact yeah, numbers, but that is no that's my yeah, impression. But, however, just to have the picture, because in Mongolia we have a lot of private colleges, but uh, they somehow are receiving also the same current expenses per ah. student like public schools receive, ah. which creates corruption, by the way. Yeah, that's too bad. So how do you uh, manage that? Do this public, uh, the private schools, non-profit private schools, do they receive money from public? Yes, they can, but it's, it's in the form of uh, what they call student uh, financial aid. Uh -huh. So the government will provide for some low uh, income people uh -huh. grants, a small part of it, but they will also make low interest loans for the student in uh -huh. America. Yeah, not to so, the schools, but only the students. To the students, and then the students come to a school which pay. is approved and yes. they pay the tuition here. But the form is different then. Yeah, now, you know, 
Co corruption comes from people who take advantage of a system. And the system that you say in Mongolia, if the, the same amount of money is provided for private educators as for public educators, that system to me would, would make good sense because it's fair. But why that becomes corrupt? It's people that do not have a sense of ethics, which is one of the reasons I support Ayn Rand's ethics because that would provide a, a uh, structure for what is earned and what is deserved mm -hmm. for trade, the principle of trading. Please tell us about your, 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 your answer with colleges, schools. What makes principally different in uh, your for-profit schools? And you have also online education. Yes, well, I, have, I, have, um, I have 18 on-ground campuses uh -huh. and an online university, Independence University. Uh -huh. And the thing that makes it different is that we know we have to satisfy the student. Our focus is on providing the education for the student that will totally benefit them, not politically motivated. We do not teach any courses like environmentalism or racism or gender studies. We do not do any of those things. All of the courses that we teach are courses that will benefit them when they go to work. Like? Like uh, we, we, we teach all of the, uh, in our health care program, we teach health care. We teach nurses, for instance, and respiratory therapists. And what is on the curriculum is all of the things that they will actually do in the hospital when they go to work. We also provide some general education, English and mathematics and government. But even there, we focus on those general education subjects which will help them in their work and in their life, not politically motivated. So that means, since your graduate, graduates have a tailor-made or demand-based education, they can find easily jobs. Better. That is the idea. Exactly. Exactly. In fact, in, in my colleges, uh -huh. we have a, what we call a career services department. When okay. you graduate, Yes. You come to the, the career services. Yes. And then we teach you how to dress and put on a nice bow tie and yes. a suit, you see. Yes. And, and, and so that when you go to an interview, yes. what kind of questions to expect yes. and how to answer them. So we teach them to interview. We teach them to write a resume. And so they can then go and get a job, a better job, uh -huh. making more money. And that is what we believe. It's not just to graduate the student but to get them gainfully employed also. And we measure this. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you compare with other colleges, what would be the rate of employment, finding jobs immediately after graduation? Our rate would be very ha much higher than government schools, than mm. the, much, much higher. In fact, many government schools don't even count. They do not count, keep records of how many of their uh, graduates become employed. They say our job is then to graduate people, but not, not to do very much more. Now, that's not all schools, but they don't, mostly they don't count. They don't uh, keep uh, that record. So some success stories from graduates? Well, you know, it, it, we have a lot of success stories because um, the right education can transform lives. And people come in and uh, they are struggling. They may not be working, they may be unemployed, they may have dead-end jobs, and they come to a point in their life where they say, my life is not working. Mm -hmm. And then we work with them for two years or three years. And we, 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 we work with them to give them the finest, the best education, practical education. And so when they finish, they are a new person. And when they get that first job, wow. They are ecstatic, they're very pleased, delighted. And we have a lot of uh, happy students. Carl, have, I have another question, which is quite actual question in, in the country today. When we see education, we used to understand, mostly from the socialist background of, you know, backs up from socialism. Education is knowledge. 
yet it turned out not only knowledge, it's also it's kind of your relations with yourself, with the other people, your contact communications, also the way how you are formed as individually turned out. Would you agree? Yes, I absolutely. And absolutely. how you would get in the schools these things taught? We, we do teach this t to some degree. Um, perhaps we should teach more what we call the soft skills. Okay. How you communicate, um, okay. how you get along with other people, how you make uh. presentations. Uh -huh. We do um, some courses in, in personal motivation, uh -huh. um, how you should um, um, set goals, do personal planning. Uh -huh how you could identify which mm. values mm. are important to you in mm. life, and we mm. do teach some of this. But a lot of this has to come through demonstration. Um, one of the, the values I have in my college is respect. Mm. We respect ourselves in the staff, and we also respect the student. And we demonstrate this respect. We demonstrate uh, answering questions. We demonstrate helping and generosity, and this then comes across to the student better than teaching from a textbook these things. Mm -hmm. So we demonstrate that. Well, that, you see, in our schools, per teacher around almost 40 students in, uh, uh, in the middle schools. Yeah. Which is a lot. It is. What you have seen, average, amount of students, pupils in a classroom so that the teacher works optimally based on what we have just now talked. Well, this is a tricky question, okay. It depends upon the subject. Um, sometimes the student teacher issue has to be very small, one teacher to 10 students. Other times you can have one teacher to a hundred or more. It depends mm -hmm. on the subject. Mm -hmm. And also what is really important is the training of the teacher. If the teacher is very good, mm -hmm. in some subjects they can treat a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, you've seen this, mm -hmm. where one teacher is clear, they are passionate about their subject, mm -hmm. they can have a classroom of hundreds of people even. Yes. You know, on the internet yes. maybe, you, have the, you see this phenomenon on the internet yes. where one uh, charismatic, uh, cl clear speaking teacher can have thousands, even, even hundreds of thousands yes. of people on the internet. So it, it, it varies, but it, when in early childhood education, this becomes more critical. And when you have children who maybe are uh, two years old or three years old or four years old, there, I think you need to keep the student-teacher ratio down to 10 or 15 mm -hmm. or 20. That's where you need to have more engagement on an individual basis. How to get these people communicating, respecting each other, these students? Well, in my organizations, it is so because this is a personal value for myself, and I inculcate this through my staff. It has to come from the leadership, from the top people who adopt these values and then express them and they demonstrate them with their staff and they respect their staff. And then the staff and teachers who are being respected, they then pass this along through their colleagues and to their students. Okay, my last question, is, about last question is about Cato Institute. What is this about? Yeah. Well, I, I'm involved with the uh, Cato Institute. I, I support them financially, and I'm on the board of directors of the Cato Institute. I think the Cato Institute is doing really excellent work. Mm -hmm. They're not political in as much as they do not support either party. Mm -hmm. And if they have criticisms, they cr 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 uh, criticize both parties on things. They are mm -hmm. nonpartisan. They won't mm -hmm. support either party. They're completely free and independent of any government funding at all. They won't take mm -hmm. any money from government. Mm -hmm. And they have a series of principles. Mm -hmm. And they believe in limited government. Mm -hmm. And they believe that people should be allowed to freely mm -hmm. live their lives, freely start businesses mm -hmm. without government intrusion, without government restrictions. Mm -hmm. They don't believe in government restrictions. They believe so in letting they do, people free. Uh, I have met several people from the Cato Institute. 
have seen reading, and they were at some time they were delivering very good CDs before all this high speed came. Yeah. Uh, and it's very impressive works. Yes. Uh, how do they measure the impact on the way that people think society behaves? Well, that's, that's, that's a difficult, but they do have some, a lot of feedback uh -huh. from news articles, mm -hmm. the, how much time people, how many times people cite their books or articles. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes their work is translated into uh, legislation. Mm -hmm. Somebody writes a paper or a book and then they find mm -hmm. that uh, a law is being uh, um, uh, passed mm -hmm. which, which uh, encompasses their ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there is some tangible, a lot of it is very long term mm -hmm. and, and not so easily measured, but the Cato Institute is measured and is one of the strongest, most successful uh, libertarian free market uh, think tanks in the world. In the world. In the world, yeah. Uh, in terms of with beyond the U.S., the idea of libertarian ideas, how does it go? How do you find that situation? <sighs> Well, it gets better and it gets worse. <laughs> okay. You know, just like in Mongolia, it looks good, <laughs> promising, and then not so promising. But I think there are there are so many good people today. Uh, uh, you, the good work you. that you are doing, many more of these think tanks. They didn't exist 40 years ago. Now True. there's th think tanks all over the world. I cannot <clears throat> imagine I'm, if I was here. 20 years ago. Uh, yes, <laughs> things would be different. <laughs> things, and things 20 years from now will be much different because of the good work of people such as you. And I'm also very encouraged because Ayn Rand is now all over the world. Um, I'm traveling with Yaron Brook, your, your former interviewee. And wherever we go, Mongolia, Ayn Rand is, is known and her books are being translated and her books are becoming discussed. And, and this is very encouraging because Ayn Rand's novels, they create the, the, the spirit, the inspiration for people to say, this is interesting. It depicts the world in, in colorful terms, which you can't get from a textbook, a, a nonfiction book. Now, she also has many nonfiction books, but she provides the, the vision, the inspiration. And so that's why I think her novels are so important being translated into Mongolian and, and many dozens of other languages around the world. And I think this is a very hopeful sign too. You have seen so far a part of Mongolia. Have you any noticeably something that you would wonder why is it go like this or if what particular things that you would think, well, we should, be, we should improve this and that? Um, not particularly. I am, I am so pleased to be in Mongolia. I've been here for one day. I have no idea that there is such spirit here, that people such as you and others who are passionate about ideas and making Mongolia a better country. I'm very optimistic for Mongolia because I think it's, it's small enough that you and some others can, can embrace it and make a significant difference. Perhaps you will become the first free market country in the world. And wouldn't that be wonderful? In which sense? Well, you would have a, uh, a world, a, a, a laboratory, if you like, a, a, a country that adopts the, the, the free market economy, the free market principles, the politics, and that you have as created a free society. And that the, the work that you're doing becomes reality in Mongolia. Now, wouldn't that be a dream? That would be fantastic. And I believe that now we are just before the final battle to win, which is corruption. Yeah. And hopefully we'll win. And, uh, but I may say, you know, it's not sufficient to fight corruption. One must also, in my view, promote the positive views, the positive ideas, and spend, you have, to, you have to talk about and criticize what is wrong. But for the most part, and this is Ayn Rand's view, you need to promote and talk about the positive ideas, uh, true ideas, and get that proper philosophy out into the community while also criticizing the, the, the bad things that are happening. Well, that's good philosophy. 
the, but the, also this idea of philosophies, I, I take it seriously and uh, in a good way, also because we are too optimist. The whole societies, you know, we are praying everything, you know, you know, giving all prices, you know, of the huge, of the sizes, planet. Mm -hmm. uh, so still, we need to develop this critical thinking and forget completely the, our centrally planned economic thinking. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Which is kind of promoting this state violence on you and you, on the way you live, on the way you choose. Yes. Well, in that sense, I would like to thank you, Carl, coming to Mongolia, sharing your thoughts with broader audience and coming on my program, which will be seen in many, I mean, bilingual people. So I think it is a contribution towards making that the dream you are describing comes true. Well, thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Appreciate it. The Huntus Chite, another man at the Facton of Turgin, the Chnor, American Exos in Cato Institute, which by the Tinny Tozindar, knowing Carl Banyard's law, Quirla.